We are beginning a uh, a new lesson this evening. The mic's on. Can you hear that? You good? All right. Just making sure. Battle for our loyalty, our careers in regard to lesson 15. If you have a need for a lesson outline, please raise your hand and uh, Bob will be able to see your hand and he'll get one to you if you need one. Lesson 15. We've covered a lot of ground up to this point. We're coming down to really the end of this particular study on spiritual warfare. And um, maybe like this lesson in particular doesn't seem like one that fits in with spiritual warfare. But I assure you, as we go through this, if you haven't already read some of the passages and and looked at the questions, uh, it very much does fit into spiritual warfare. Because at any area and at every level of our lives, Satan is trying to work against us, to disrupt us, to distract us, to get us to stumble in some sort of fashion, and that is no less prevalent in the jobs and the careers that we choose to work in our lives, Being con- especially considering that, uh, you know, as careers and jobs, whatever they are, we know that uh, we spend a lot of time there. It takes up a lot of our time. And so, obviously, the people that we are around, the choices that we make in those environments, Uh, are either conducive to us being able to allow Christ to be seen in us and shine through to the the point that we can actually be of an example of Christ, let our light shine in the workplace, or it can actually be a place where our life as a Christian is unbecoming because we allow ourselves to be unequally yoked. We allow ourselves to be influenced by those in the workplace who are of the world, perhaps, and they pull us away. And we can see that in many different facets in our lives uh, that we... um, that we're getting pulled in. So, of course, careers is, is of great importance for us to understand within this spiritual battle, but not just careers. Lord willing, Lesson 16 is about money. Lesson 17 is about time management. And then we're going to be getting into the battle for our relationships with uh, the home, with the church. And then finally, Lord willing, saying that we see this all the way through the end of the year, we're going to be talking about stumbling at the finish line and kind of be putting some safeguards up so we don't find ourselves stumbling uh, like we uh, sometimes can be found doing. And so good to see each and every one of you out tonight. We do have some visitors among us. We're glad, we're honored that you're here. We pray that the things that we have to do and cover this evening will be of great benefit to everyone and that, of course, it glorifies God. Would you go with me in prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, we humbly come before you. We're ever grateful, Father, for this opportunity to yet again open up your word, to glean from it, Father. May we make application from the things of which we've are going to cover this evening to our daily lives. We thank you, Father, for all the teachers and the students that make up the Bible study this hour. We just pray, Father, that the, they'll be blessed and that you'll be glorified. We're thankful, Father, for the beautiful day that we've had. Even though there's rain, we know, Father, that nourishes the ground. And we just know, Father, that all things are in your hands. And we're so thankful for that. We're so thankful, Father, that you knew our lives and the days of our lives and all things about us. And it gives us comfort. We just pray, Father, that we'll trust in you, in your will, not our own. We thank you, Father, for your son Jesus, his sacrifice for us, and the the redemption that brings to us. We pray, Father, that you just forgive us where we fell, as we often do. Pray, Father, that we'll be forgiving towards others and be merciful and kind as you have shown yourself to us through your amazing grace. Again, Father, we thank you for Jesus and all that he has done for us and the spiritual blessings that we have in him. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. All right, so let's talk about careers then for a moment. And before we really get to starting getting to the questions, I want to talk about three principles that I put together that I believe uh, perhaps will help us in directing ourselves and choosing the proper career path. And if we already are in careers or jobs, to make sure that these principles and the things that we're going to be covering are going to continue to guide us in the right direction. If we find ourselves getting off track from living out godly principles in our lives, that we'll make sure we make a a quick turn or adjustment in that path so to make sure that we are uh, walking in accordance with God's will. And so as Christians, one of our main desires, actually the ultimate desire that we ought to have in our lives is to aim to please who? God, right? I mean, that is the ultimate aim that should be our ultimate desire to live our life in a way that pleases God. And that's not just when we come together and to assemble in the worship. That's in the home. That's with our spouses in our uh, marriages. That's with our raising of our children. That's with friends and the influences we have in those circles. And it's in the work. It's in the school. It's in our day-to-day lives. And so that should be a major aim in our lives. And so we want to do His will. We want to do His will 
in every and all aspects of our lives. Uh, in the daily choices that we make that govern our actions. We want to be using God's will to give us that direction and not our own will. And oftentimes, some, you know, if we're trying to jump ahead of what God supplies us, we oftentimes revert back to our will and doing it our way or what we desire more sometimes than what God desires. So God gives us, in His Scriptures, has given us standards. He has given us a path. He has given us clear guidelines when it comes to making moral decisions in our lives. And I think we can go to the Old Testament, we can clearly look at the Ten Commandments. We can go over into the New Testament, we can clearly look at the Sermon on the Mount. God has given us some pretty clear guidelines and instruction on how we ought to live our lives, how we ought to be the salt and the light of the world in which we live in, to be a light to those who are in a world of darkness and sin. But what about when it comes to making choices about career? What we're going to do for the work that we engage in in our lives? Is there any specific guideline in the Bible that we can go to where God says, thou shalt be this in your career and do this for so many years. Do we have that? No, we don't have that. And so there's some things that we really need to look into to help us hone in in regard to what it is that God expects of us when making such life decisions. And so again, nowhere in Scripture are we going to find with specificity that God tells us this is exactly the path that we uh, ought to go. Now, there's some reason for this. And thinking about the reasons for this, you know, we could go down a rabbit hole, I suppose, but two main reasons that I'm just going to throw out there. But when the book was written, and in the prevalent in those times, most women did not work. Uh, they, they married, they had children, they took care of the home. Men, typically in that day and age, they carried on with the family business, whether it was farming, whether it was uh, carpentry, whatever the case may be, fishing. Uh, so forth and so on. And so it was kind of a understanding that you were going to go that path. Not always, but most of the time. And so the burning issues of what career do I need to choose? You know, uh, I, I can tell you right now, just as Alec and Aiden are in college and just previous to going to college, we we're talking to him, you know, what do you want to do? I don't know. Yeah, I have no idea. And you know, so it was a very much of a struggle to try and even figure that out. Well, you don't have to figure it out right away, but eventually you got to figure it out, right? Uh, some people, it's, it's hard. They can't put a finger on what it is exactly they want to do. Some people say, you know, if you do what you love and if you're passionate about it, you never work a day in your life. But, you know, can you really work a career in the passions that you have? Possibly, but maybe not. So how do you wade through making all those decisions? Because today we have uh, career decisions all over the place. There are a lot of options that you can go after uh, that are available, and more and more we see than what was ever in, in history. And so there's a lot of different options that are out there. And so how do we make the right decision that is in accordance with God's will so that the career, or the job, or the path of which we work is pleasing to God? And so again, I want to just share a few principles, three principles that I throw out there, and then we'll get to the question. Number one. Our first priority in life is an obvious. We must always develop an increasingly intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. And so oftentimes, how do we gauge success? How does the world like to gauge success? Money, Money right? Uh, it's about numbers. If you remember earlier on in the year when we began the yearly theme on devotion, uh, we talked about how a lot of times congregations will determine their success in fruitfulness by way of a congregation by the numbers. How many people do we have showing up on Sunday morning, on Sunday night, on Wednesday? What's the collection look like? You know, we talk about numbers. How many people have we baptized this year? And a lot of emphasis is on the numbers. But when we look at Acts chapter 2, we find that the emphasis wasn't on numbers at all. In fact, numbers aren't given until the very end of that chapter when it talks about how many souls were saved and the Lord was adding to the church daily those who were being saved. Before then, what we find is the word devotion. They were devoted first to the Lord. They were devoted to the apostolic doctrine. They're devoted to prayer, devoted to the Lord's Supper, devoted, devoted, devoted. And so their gauge of success was based on what they were giving themselves to. They were devoted to this. Now, when we think about that, we oftentimes gauge our fruitfulness in the world that we live in, in the career that we work in, is what we do, how we do it, how much we do it, how busy we are, how much money we make, how many... Uh, how much money am I putting away in my you know, 401k or IRA or whatever the case may be? How much is the company matching in those things? You know, all these things 
uh, how busy we are, how much work I get done. We look at these things as gauges for success. But here again is just another layer of your life that you're to engage in, but still ultimately always keep Christ first. And so regardless of what you're doing, don't gauge your success based off of numbers. The hows and the, and the wheres, but who? And that is Jesus. And so we've got to gauge our fruitfulness. John chapter 15, verses 5 through 6, Jesus said that all of this doesn't matter. The numbers, the salaries, the longevity of a career, the who's you work with, the elbows that you've rubbed, uh, none of that matters, especially if you don't have that connection with him. And Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. If, I am, if a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. That's the fruit that you want to be concerned with in this life. The others are, are blessings, but those blessings that is received upon everybody on this earth, sun, the moon, the yields, the many things that we enjoy in this life, none of those things are going to be your way to heaven. True fruitfulness. But your attachment to the vine, the one that truly helps you yield true fruit in this life, is what really, truly matters. Because careers come and go. Money comes and it goes. Time comes and goes. All these things. But Jesus is forever. Eternity is eternity. And so again, you will bear much fruit if you remain in him. Apart from him, you can't do anything. If anyone does not remain in me, he is like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. And so what is the very first thing that Jesus tells us that we need to have as priority number one? Matthew chapter 6, verse 33. What do you seek first in this life? Yes. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Can we put a finger on any Bible verse that says, seek first the career of your choice? so that you are happy and joyful based off of how you are earning money and the pleasures that you have in the work that you do? No. The seeking of anything that we do as Christians, the world will tell you differently, but the seeking that we do as Christians, first and foremost, above all other things, is to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, not to seek what we do with our careers, not to seek what pleases us first, but what pleases the Lord. And so being rooted in Christ is a fundamental, in my opinion, it's a fundamental prerequisite with regard to finding what is the right career for me according to God's will. Because if I'm seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, there's going to be certain things that might open up as opportunities, so-called opportunities in my life, that I realize I don't need to be taking that on. That's not the avenue I should be going. It's going to take me away from this. It's going to rob me of this. It's going to be consume me from this. And inevitably, it's going to take me away from seeking first what is most important. And so if that's an opportunity that's being presented to me, and it looks really, really good, but it doesn't align with that seek first mentality that God expects us to have, then perhaps I need to look elsewhere. I need to reorganize my priorities. And so if we're not rooted as we ought to be, then we're not going to be ready and able to find the career that God would desire us to be in. And there's a lot out there that we can be engaging our lives in uh, and seek to please Him at the same time. Principle number two is that God has created you with the aptitude for skills and abilities and with the inclination toward interests. In other words, you're God's handiwork. God has created you. He knows you. He knows what makes you tick. He knows the abilities and the talents that you have. In fact, we're told in Psalm 139, 13 through 14, that you are fearfully and wonderfully made. God has created you, and you have been given work-related gifts that have been chosen specifically for you. In fact, we go to Romans chapter 12, and now this contextually is more in the arrangement of your work and your talents and your abilities being utilized within the work of the church and ministry, that we all have been given something, some this, some that, some this, some that, but you are expected to use those within the organism of the body of Christ, to help it build up, to encourage it, to help it grow. But also those same abilities and those same talents that God has given us to be able to utilize and function with within the body are also abilities and talents that can be used 
in our day-to-day lives. And so working out our design of how God designed us uh, certainly will bring you satisfaction. I don't know if you've ever tried to work a job to where you really weren't that good at it, right? You just, you just don't, you don't have the skill sets. You really don't have the ability. And it's okay to acknowledge that. I, I, this is not, I'm not good at this. And it's not being pessimistic. It's not being, you know, a Debbie Downer. It's just the, it's just the facts. I have strengths and I have weaknesses. I need to stay in my lane and I need to do what I do and do it well and excel in that. And there's other things that I'm going to struggle with that I'm not that great at that other people are more fitted to do. And I believe we find that, especially in Romans 12, when it comes to the work of the church. I think we referred to this back a few lessons ago. Not everyone's a teacher. Not everyone should be a teacher. Not everyone's a song leader. Not everyone should be a song leader. Not everyone's a preacher. Not everyone can do this or do that. But there is something that we all can do, surely, because God has created us with that ability. We need to hone in on what those skill sets are, what those abilities are, how God has created us, and use those gifts in a work-related way that have been chosen specifically for us. And so for us to make good career decisions, we must have a good understanding of who we are. Who am I in Christ? What things have I come to recognize about my personality, about my skills, about my abilities that allow me, number one, first and foremost, to glorify God but secondly, to be able to utilize in the workplace or in such a way to help other people too. What can I do? And it shouldn't be the mentality of, I can't do that, I can't do this, I can't. No, but what God has given to you to do, figure that out. What is that? And do you know what that is? I believe you'll be greatly satisfied in the life that you live and in the work that you do with the hands that you have and the mind that God has given to you. If you come to know who you are in Christ, your personality your strengths, even some of your weaknesses. And to be able to stay in that lane and do it and do it well, excel all the more with that. But without that knowledge, it's going to be hard to be fully equipped the way that you need to be in the work that you do in this life. And so look at what God has given to you. Hone in on that and utilize that in choosing a career. Number three, being a Christian does not exempt us from the responsibilities to become wise in our decisions. It is our responsibility to use our God-given mind to learn how to make a good career choice, let alone any choice in this life. God has given us the faculty of mind to choose. You go back to the lesson we did on our victory in Christ. This one thing that we've seen through and through of this entire series of lessons on spiritual warfare is that we have an opportunity to choose. Choose to follow Christ or choose not to choose to put on the whole armor of God, or we choose not to. And so in this method of even in our careers, we have a choice. God has given us the ability to cho- cho- uh, choose. I think of, I, I think of the idea, if, if we're seeking to buy, let's say a computer, right? We're going to buy a computer. We're going to buy some, a TV. I don't know. Something. We're going we're gonna to buy a computer. Let's say we're going to buy a computer. Now, just because I have this idea that I'm going to buy a computer, I'm not just going to jump into the first store and say the first computer I put my finger on, that's it. Because that may not fit me. That may be lacking or it may be too much of something that I need. May overpay, may not pay enough. And so what I'm going to be intentional about then, what I'm going to aim to do is that I'm going to do my research. What is best? What is probably going to fit my needs and my goals the most? And of course, Speaking of life, it's going to align with God in my seek first mentality. And so what is it that I can do that's going to help align with that? And and then I'm going to identify those very specific things and identify the specific needs that I have, what I'm trying to obtain and what I'm going after. And I'm going to investigate those things. And it's like investigating the prices for the computer, right? I've done some research. I've identified these are the needs that I have. I'm in looking into the pricing, the investigating the pricing, and then I make the purchase. That's a wise decision. Now, when it comes to our careers, of course, prayer is involved in that. And continuing in that, prayer is involved in that, but we still have to do our part in making wise decisions as well. And so for us as Christians, learning to make decisions is a part of developing our wisdom and our Christian maturity, both in which God desires for us to have. And I would tell you, Proverbs, and you see Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 on there, 
is full of admonitions and instructions of the importance of gaining wisdom to life uh, and how to live a life that is pleasing to God. In Proverbs 1, 1 through 3, for attaining wisdom and discipline, for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a discipline and prudent life, this is what this is all about. And so God desires for us to have that spiritual maturity, not just working within the walls or the confines of the ministry of church, not just in the confines of our home and raising our children or how we treat our spouses, not just in how we treat other people, but also in all of our life decisions, careers included. God expects us to use wisdom and discernment, and he expects us to put him first in those decisions, and regardless of whatever decision of life, that may be. Three principles I share with you as we uh, break into this lesson. Any comments or questions before we move any further? So what is the purpose of having a job? What'd you say there? Providing for your family? Anything else? Okay, but what's the purpose for the job? Purpose. You got providing for our family. Is there anything else? Providing for self. Okay. Fulfilling a skill. All right, using skills and abilities. Contribution for the saints. Okay, to be able to be benevolent towards other people with the means, right? All these are great answers. I only put two. You guys really kind of blew this one out of the water for me. <laughs> But number one, to provide for our families. 2 Thessalonians 3, 7 through 8, and also verse 10, for you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because you did not act, I'm sorry, because we did not act in an undisciplined way among you. And so to be not working, to be living off of the government, to be living off the backs of other people. Now, if you recall, we did... First and second Thessalonians study at the beginning of the year through about mid-year. And one of the things that we find in the letter to the Christians at Thessalonica is that some of them were anticipating the Lord's return immediately. Therefore, they stopped working altogether. And in doing so, they, asked their, they had their hands out asking their brothers and sisters to help them out with their needs, living off the backs of their brothers and sisters. And Paul condemns them for this way of living. You can't do that. And so here, as we move along through the letters, 2 Thessalonians 3, you yourselves know how you ought to follow our example because we did not act in an undisciplined way among you. In other words, to act that way is to live in an undisciplined way, which is not becoming of a Christian. Nor did we eat anyone's bread without paying for it, but with labor and hardship we kept working night and day so that we would not be a burden to any of you. Okay, so if we're following Paul's example here, both hard work and the willingness to sacrifice is what we see of this example, what he is talking about then in our daily lives when we choose to work and we work hard and we do it as unto the Lord as we'll find in Colossians chapter 3, what that does directly and indirectly is that it furthers the integrity of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because we're not becoming a burden to anybody. In fact, we're doing the opposite of that. We're helping people. And in doing so, again, with the seek first mentality, in doing all that I do unto the Lord, I recognize that the work that I work is as if I'm working for Him. And in doing such, I work hard. I have integrity behind that. It's going to help me perhaps build relationships, have conversations with people otherwise that I would not have if I was living an undisciplined life. And ultimately, ultimately, it's going to glorify God because this is what he's told me to do. And if I'm obedient to this, it brings God glory. And there's going to be fruitfulness that is reaped from this. Verse 10 says, For even when we were with you, we used to give you this order. Here's the order. If anyone is not willing to work, then he is not to eat either. Now, I want you to recognize something that Paul says here. He says, will not instead of cannot. If he's not willing to work, if, he's will, if he will not do that, all right, we're not talking about those who cannot work here. There are some people that have 
through tragedies in life or whatever the case may be, they cannot work. But if I have the ability to work, and we all know if we have the ability to work, and we're, we're talking about laziness here, okay? The will not. I don't have a desire to go and earn my wages, to earn my bread. I don't have that desire. There are some people that cannot do that because physically, mentally, or some other reason, they just can't do that. And so because of that, Paul is making sure he's emphasizing the will not here, the desire of one's heart. And so part of God's plan is not to provide for our every whim and our every need. No, instead, the way that God provides for us in our life is through the work that we do that glorifies him. Solomon says, enjoy the fruit of your labor, the sweat of your brow. Work hard. You read through Ecclesiastes, and it has a lot to say about that. That there's fruit in your labor, whereas the will not in the undisciplined life, as we'll see in just a moment in Timothy's account, it likens you to an unbeliever, an infidel. Someone's not worthy of God's blessing. So God demands, in fact, this is what Paul says, here's the order that I give you. Here's a command from God that you work. And if you don't work, if you have the ability to work and you choose not to work, you don't have the desire to work, then you don't eat. What's that say to individuals like us who are working that sees that someone needs to eat, but yet they have the ability to eat, but they don't choose to eat? Or work, but they don't choose to work. How, 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 how much of a heart do we have towards trying to help them? It's hard, isn't it? Because we see someone in need, but what do we call that? Well, yeah, it's lazy. But on our part, if we continue to give to somebody that refuses to work, what are we doing to them? We're enabling that. We're enabling a bad behavior. In other words, we're actually condoning it at that point. We've got to use wisdom and discernment in our own lives and understanding that God also gives a directive to us who are willing to work and who can work and do work hard that we don't just, just haphazardly just throw to every need that's out there. We need to recognize and discern and test those spirits. And if that's the case, you know, it's kind of hard to do sometimes because you're not going to give them like a, you know, 30-question assessment. All right, can you work? All right, check all these boxes. I mean, I want to know if you really are can, can or cannot. I mean, it's, you know, sometimes it's, it's just judgment, and we use our best judgment towards those things. But again, specifically here in the context, Paul's dealing with Christians. Christians, brothers and sisters who have taken on this mindset, this disposition, this attitude, this heart, that I'm not going to work. And Paul says, no, nope, that's not going to fly with God. You don't work, you don't eat. You have the ability, but you're choosing not to. So it's not going to happen. And so this is one of the things that we find being inferred here then in this particular passage, that God has chosen for us, for the most part, to meet our needs through our own work. He talks about eating, right? We all like to eat. We like to be filled with that sustenance. God tells you how you're going to get it. You're going to get it by the sweat of your brow. You're going to get it by working with your hands. You're going to get it by an honest day, an honest way, an honest pay. You're going to get it by working. Now, in the instance that desperate times come, I fall on those hard times. I think we can go to Matthew chapter 6, and it talks about not worrying about those things that you're going to eat not worrying about things of, that, are, that are necessary in your life that God is going to provide. Now, how does he provide for those? I'm trying, to, I'm, I'm trying to work. I'm doing my part. I'm carrying my own sack, my own burden. I'm doing my part. But you know what? Whether I've been outsized, downsized, left side, right size, whatever the case may be, I'm not able to make this happen this month. i have not prospered, okay? I can't give, and I can't even try to help my family. Seek first what? The kingdom of God. And what is the kingdom of God? The church and his righteousness. And he will add these things unto you. In other words, that's when your brothers and sisters do come to your aid. But not because you choose not to work and you have your hand out saying, please give, I'm hungry. No, go put your work boots on and go work. And that's what God is saying. And so there's, there's, there's an understanding there and the inference that is there that we need to understand that there's a responsibility on the part of those that do work and the responsibility on the part of those who choose not to work. And so I, I look at it like this. Is God always at work? Then so should we be. As long as we have that ability, we should be at work because God is always working on our behalf. All right? Uh, 
Ephesians chapter, well, let me go back to 1 Timothy 5, 7 through 8. Uh, Give these instructions as well so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and his own here is extended family, aunts, uncles, cousins, your family, your blood. But then he gets even more specific, and especially for those of his household, children, spouse, all right? He, speaking in the masculine here, we're talking about the man of the home, has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. And so God's, again, normal way of providing for the family, providing for you, is through your work and through your work to provide for your family, not the local church. The church is not the welfare program for the saints. And it should never be looked at that way. I think it's interesting that we find Paul in the strongest of terms emphasizing the responsibility of the man to provide for his family here. To do all that he possibly can do to make sure these needs are met. And if not, his conduct as a Christian man is worse than someone who has denied the faith an unbeliever. And so what is that like? Into How do we come to a conclusion? How does Paul come to the conclusion that he's worse than an infidel, an unbeliever, someone who's denied the faith? What is he really saying there? What does he violate? What is this Christian man violated by not providing for his family? What is one of the greatest commands? Love the Lord your God, heart, mind, soul, and strength, right? So I'm going to do his will. Love your neighbor as yourself. But what do we find even... What do we find tied to children obey your parents? It's pleasing to the Lord. To honor your mother and your father. So this is part of the same household, because back then in, in that day and age, oftentimes they kind of commune together. But one of the things that we find here is this own household even, even those within your own household. So it neglects to honor your father and your mother. Okay, now caveat here, because I, I want to put a disclaimer out there. If father and mother are not following the Lord and doing his will and doing their part, or at least trying to do their part in providing for themselves, all right, we've got we to gotta use proper judgment and, and understanding there. But again, we find that it's a lack of love. And faith is always active in love. You can't separate love and faith. Not true faith and not true love. They're always actively engaging one with another. And if I'm not willing to provide, then I'm worse than an unbeliever, an infidel. I've, I've chosen to disregard and neglect and honor my father, my mother. I've chosen to disregard and neglect the idea of faith and love being practiced in my life to make sure others' needs have been met, especially, especially in the passage of making sure that it's within my own household. And then we look at, so we won't uh, be dishonest and steal Ephesians 4.28. The one who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, producing with his own hands what is good so that he will have something to share with the one who has need. All right, so this isn't just about you. My career isn't just about me. My work isn't just about me. It gives me another opportunity to find an opportunity to give. And so we see that working and coming all together. Any comments or questions? Number two, what priority should a job have in your life? What priority should a job have in your life? Say that again, Judy. I saw you mouthing something back there. Okay. All right. So ultimately, there has to be a a glorifying factor here in what I do under God, right? Anybody else? Huh? Okay. Yeah. All right. So priorities, right? Order of priority. You know, one thing that we look at, I may be, uh, I just use me for an example. I'm a gospel preacher. I'm a father, I'm a husband, but I'm always a Christian. I'm always a Christian in all this. And so whatever I do, whether it's the work, whether it's the parenting, whether it's the the marriage, 
Well, there's the shepherding. I'm always a Christian first. And so God has to be glorified in every aspect of my life. And so there's priority there. And so our purpose must be to do the will of God. Our job should be for the benefit of our families, to help support the local congregation, and to assist other people. When I go and I work, I, I, I enjoy what I do. I love what I do. But there's a purpose behind this. There's a priority in this. And the priority is to make sure that my family goes, doesn't go without and make sure that I can support the local work because that is of great importance to me in my life and is to help others so that they can have what they might need to have. And, but there has to be a proper balance here because I can't give everything that I earn to other people to the neglect of my family or to the neglect of the church. And I can't give everything I have to the church at the neglect of my family or at the neglect of helping other people. And so I have to have a balance. There has to be a balance that is struck here. Number three, how should we decide what kind of job we should take? What is our standard here? What is your standard? Ava, you had something? <laughs> She's like, no, Dad, don't call me. What's your standard? I want to talk to the young people here a second. What's your standard for the job you take? We're going to be quiet until someone answers. All right, Ben, you're in college. What's your standard for a job? Aiden, you're in college. Don't make me feel like I failed, okay? Uh, if it's not according to God's word, you shouldn't do it. So what do you mean by that? Let's elaborate this. Okay. All right, so if my job is taking me away from the Lord, whether it's worship, communing with the saints, prayer, study, whatever the case, if it's in any sort of way, if it's taking me away from God, something else has a priority in my life, right? And that's trouble. That's trouble. That's something is brewing. Something bad is going to happen. How will this job affect my walk with God? All right? It's not about me. It's about what, what good I can do for others. Okay. That's always my job. All right. How, how will this benefit others? All right. If not now, but sometime in the future. Sure. But when you decide for a job, the standard we go by, first and foremost, I heard someone say, oh, was it Michael? He was doing the, the priorities there. All right, so how's it going to affect my walk with God? How will this job affect my family? Should I be concerned at all how my career affects my family? What happens when dad is chasing his career so much that kids are left to themselves and left to mom most of the time? Where's dad at? Does the dad's absentee in the life of the children affect them at all? Is it important that dad is home? Is it understandable that dad may have to go away from time to time to do his work? But if he chooses to continue in a career that constantly pulls him away from leading his family, and sure, he's putting bread on the table. Sure, the bank account's filled. But if I'm constantly away from leading my children in the Lord, if I'm constantly away from leading my wife in the Lord, if I'm not there to help support them, especially in important life decisions that they will be making as they grow older, is it possible I'm doing harm? In that home? Absolutely. How will this job affect my work in God's kingdom? And what do I mean by that? Well, we're all called to be disciples and to make disciples. I'm a disciple maker. We're all ministers. Every one of us who are God's children are ministers of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so if my work has such a priority in my life, it may not rob me from my Sunday worship. But every other day of the week, I'm so tied up, so busy, so overwhelmed with the work that I do, I don't even have time to talk about Jesus with somebody. My mind is so overwhelmed with work that I can't do it. And it can be solely about salary. And it shouldn't be. Some people make a move in their salary. Some people choose jobs specifically because of what's behind the dollar sign. 
And if that is what you chase in life, you're going to find nothing but trouble. Money is good. It does a lot of good things. Money is not evil. The love of money is evil. But money can help your family. Money can help other people. Money can help the church. Money is needed. It's how we buy stuff. It's how we support people. It's important. So I'm not downplaying making a good wage and making a really good wage. God has blessed some people to make really good wages. But they still understand that their walk with God comes first. Not second to a career, but first. God comes first. And I truly believe that if God is first in one's life, everything else will fall into place the way it ought to. And you will reap much from that. You may not reap the biggest salary that you could have in life, but you will reap seeing your children grow up in the Lord. You'll reap seeing them remain faithful. You'll reap seeing a beautiful marriage that's not been disrupted by being absent all the time. You'll see a lot of good things come out of that. You might not have the newest of cars and the greatest, biggest house and the best boat and the best this and all that. You might have to buy something used. That's okay because it's not about the material things. It's about being attached to the vine and glorifying God. All right? How might Satan attack you through your job? Promotions? How so? Sorry about the bewildered look there. Okay, all right, surprise. All right, that's good, Dylan. All right. Bob, how much time do I have? I never know. Uh, five minutes. Five minutes. All right, we're going to get through this. All right. Let's talk about relationships. Has there ever been a work-related affair that's taken place that's ruined a marriage? Yeah. You think? So if I'm in a work environment that's conducive, to the disrespect and the dishonoring of God's holy matrimony? Is it possible that I might need to start putting some resumes out? This is not the environment for me as a Christian. I'll be honest with you, when I was a sheriff's deputy, one of the sole reasons why I left being a sheriff's officer is because that environment was not, that was the worst part of Don and I's marriage. The absolute worst. And I'm not saying that's for every police officer who is a Christian that's out there. That was just for us. There's a lot of priority and a lot of demands that came out of that job that affected our marriage in a great way. Alex's whole first year of his life, I missed it because I was working third shift and she was being mom alone. She was taking him here, doing this, and I slept because I was working third shift. I, I had a weekend off every six weeks, and then I brought work home. I was so heavily involved, and it, just got, it was a breaking point for us. And the best thing I was able to do was to leave it. I liked what I did. But I had to ask myself, what is more important? My wife or my job? I had to make that decision. Our job may have an impact on our attitude toward life and the blessings that God gives us. Some jobs drive us in such a way that it is all about money. Or it's all about pleasing man. And it takes my attitude away from spiritual things and puts it on material things or being a man pleaser, right? It can cause us to lose focus on what really matters in life. What really matters? What really matters, dads and moms, with your kids? Does it really matter that they get the best degree and they get the best career and they make the best money so that they can show off and they can have all these other things, great things? No, we just, we pray that God will bless them and they'll do well in life. But the main focus that we want for them and what we should want for ourselves is, again, God. That's our focus, right? God comes first. Let's talk about reading Colossians 3, 22 through 25. That's the short amount of time that we have here. Slaves in all things obey those who are your masters on earth, not with external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done, and that without partiality. And so granted, the context of this is with regard to servants, and, but I do believe there's principles that we can apply for all of us here. 
And I'm just going to throw these three up there. We need to make sure that we have the right attitude with respect to the job and that the work that we doing are doing is that which also pleases God. We work as unto the Lord. We work as if the Lord himself is our employer, that he's the one that's giving the direction that we have in this life and that we are working to please him. And ultimately, at the end of our work day, ultimately at the end of our work week and at the end of our work life, we recognize that God has witnessed all things. God knows whether or not we worked as we ought to have worked. Man may not recognize it. We may not get the promotion. We may be overlooked for this or for that. But what we do know is that God has seen all. And to that degree, we will be rewarded for how we have worked as unto him, which is, again, great uh, importance. I'm going to take about two minutes here. We're just going to close out this particular lesson. Satan can tempt us in a variety of ways through our careers. I'd ask you to list some examples of how we might be tempted and how we might overcome them, not to labor on this because it does tie a little bit in regard to question number four. So I'm just going to put these four points on here for you to consider. Again, remember our purpose, family, church, others, always God first and foremost. Romans 13, 14 speaks about making no provisions to the flesh or for the flesh, right? Awarding the flesh is not our priority in life. Satan will tempt you in that. He'll try to get you to gratify your desires of the flesh before you think of what you should be doing unto God. Don't lose your influence with others on the job. Remember that you are a Christian every day, everywhere. So wherever you are, with ever who you are with, the environment, the circumstances, what is that? Wherever. Every day you are a Christian and you have an influence upon those that you are around. And then lastly, make sure that we seek first the kingdom of God. Priorities. And really that's what this lesson comes down to is our priorities in this life. Lord willing, on Sunday evening, we're going to look at uh, the battle for our loyalty when it comes to our money. And then if we have time, maybe even get into time management. But we'll talk about money. That's always one that's a sticky one to talk about, people's money, how they spend it, how they use it, how they save it what's the importance of it, so forth and so on. So Lord willing, we'll be ready for that lesson come Sunday evening. I appreciate your time and attention tonight.